Welcome to San Joaquin College of Law Today, a show dedicated to issues and events within the law school, which are of general interest as well. SJCL Today is produced by San Joaquin College of Law, a nonprofit law school in Clovis, founded in 1969 to provide quality legal education. Over 85% of its graduates have passed the California bar examination. More than a quarter of the practicing lawyers in the Fresno area are San Joaquin College of Law graduates. We begin our program with a lecture, May I Purchase Your Vote, Lawyer, Speech, and Money in the Age of Corporations. That was the title of this year's Constitution Day event, which drew dozens of spectators on September 20th. San Joaquin College of Law Constitutional Law Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis took on the topic and its First Amendment implications in light of the recent U.S. Supreme Court decisions related to campaign donations and corporations recognized as persons entitled to free speech rights. Welcome to San Joaquin College of Law's 2012 Constitution Day celebration. The first Constitution Day celebration done with a tablet computer. I can't say which one or I would be showered with free iPads. So, <laughs> I always like to begin by acknowledging any luminaries who have joined us today. Professor Atkinson, director of the New American Legal Clinic, library director Rooney, Professor Goodrich, our torts and many other things teachers. Oh, and Governor Romney, thank you for reaching out to the 27%, sir. <laughs> Very good of you to come. <clears throat> Why do we celebrate Constitution Day? Here is what our president said about that. Quote, for more than two centuries, the Constitution has pre presided as the supreme law of the land, keeping our leaders true to America's highest ideals and guaranteeing the fundamental rights that make our country a beacon of hope to all people seeking freedom and justice. Together with the Bill of Rights, our Constitution is the backbone of our government and the basis of our liberties. Even while retaining its structure, our founding document has grown with our nation's conscience, amended over the years to extend America's promise to citizens of every race, gender, and creed. Closed quotes. Except for the homosexuals, of course. <clears throat> also, San Joaquin College of Law is required to observe Constitution Day as a condition of qualifying our students for federally supported loans. <laughs> Federal law also requires me to notify you of the following. Professor Purvis makes frequent use of sarcasm and irony. SJCL apologizes in advance to anyone offended by his remarks. All opinions expressed by Professor Purvis are his alone and do not represent the opinions of SJCL, the state of California, or the United States of America whose constitution we celebrate today. Good. Since this is a celebration of the Constitution of the United States being held at a law school by a constitutional law professor, I like to include material that might not be as interesting to an audience not closely associated to the study of law, such as theories of how the constitution should be interpreted. In an ideal world, all citizens would be well informed about con how constitutional issues are resolved because this affects us so profoundly. The questions I want to discuss here with you today are, how do judges interpret the Constitution of the United States? Why is money considered speech? Why do corporations have the right of freedom of speech? And why do people believe that the candidate with the most money will win an election? The Supreme Court of the United States and courts generally do not elucidate comprehensive theories of constitutional interpretation when deciding cases. That is left to academics. But they refer to them in justifying some of their decisions. Because the Supreme Court is dominated by extremely conservative justices, originalism championed by Justices Scalia and Thomas is the theory that they currently mention most often. 
One description of originalism is that the Constitution should be interpreted by determining what the framers intended when they framed it. This is the constitutional version of the concept of legislative intent, which includes the notion that the words of a law or rule may mean different things depending upon what the enacting body intended to accomplish when the law was created. Imagine a legislature that designated certain public lands as a wilderness area and then enacted a statute that provided it shall be unlawful to operate a motor vehicle in a wilderness area. A hundred years later, Bob is convicted of the felony of operating a motorized vehicle in a wilderness area after he drove his ambulance into the wilderness area to save the life of a child who had been severely injured while hiking. Some judges like to cite and apply the plain meaning rule. As Justice Thomas wrote in Barnhart versus Sigmund Cole Company, a 2002 decision. Quote, in all statutory construction cases, we begin with the language of the statute. The first step is to determine whether the language at issue has a plain and unambiguous meaning with regard to the particular dispute in the case. The inquiry ceases if the statutory language is unambiguous and the statutory scheme is coherent and consistent. Closed quotes. My imaginary statute seems plain and unambiguous to me. Bob is guilty as charged. But I have to wonder, is it possible that the legislature didn't think that someone whose life was in danger would need a motor vehicle to bring aid or to carry the injured person to medical treatment? That they forgot to put in important exceptions that any reasonable person would include if drafting a statute carefully with thought for the future? A conservative judge, an originalist, might argue that I was rewriting the statute and inserting my own personal values in place of those of the legislature. Bob's counsel, a disreputable person known as a criminal defense attorney, <laughs> argues that the legislature didn't mean that anyone who operated a motor vehicle in the wilderness area should be punished. He cites a record he found of the committee hearing that considered the bill that became the statute at issue. This record shows that the sponsor of the bill was concerned about harm to the wilderness from vehicles driven by recreational users and said at the committee hearing, casual use of motor vehicles by persons seeking to enjoy the wilderness threatens to destroy the very natural beauty that the wilderness designation was intended to preserve. I am vindicated. Since the legislature was acting to protect the wilderness area from casual use of motor vehicles by visitors, it must not have wished to pre pre preclude the occasional life-saving use of a motor vehicle, such as an ambulance. So Bob is innocent. Justice Thomas does not agree. In interpreting a federal statute in the Barnhart case, in response to the government's argument based on the comments of two U.S. Senators made during pre-enactment discussion of the federal law in the Senate, Thomas wrote, quote, Floor statements from two Senators cannot amend the clear and unambiguous language of the statute. We see no reason to give greater weight to the views of two Senators than to the collective votes of both houses which are memorialized in the unambigu unambiguous statutory text." Close quotes. My present and former students, many of them who are here today, are probably thinking, oh, Professor Purvis, we love your crazy antics, but no legislature would be insane or stupid enough to enact a statute like the one you describe. Of course, they are correct. I am crazy. <laughs> And no legislature would ever enact a law that appeared to be so absolute without thinking of how it would be applied in real situations and providing for important exceptions like ambulances. But consider this rule. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. What is the plain meaning of that rule? What did the enactors of that law intend it to mean? Who were the enactors? whose intent we should look to? The rich white political leaders who drafted it? 
the propertied white males who voted to adopt it? Assuming we can identify the correct group whose intent we should effectuate, how will we determine what their intent was? Certainly not by something they wrote that wasn't even part of the process of deliberation preceding adoption. The Supreme Court considered this type of evidence of legislative intent in United States versus O'Brien, a 1968 decision. Congress had enacted a law, amended it actually, that made it a crime to knowingly destroy a Selective Service Registration Certificate or draft card. For you younger folks, during the Vietnam era, the United States had compulsory military service for males. Little known fact. O'Brien, prosecuted because he burned his draft card publicly to protest the Vietnam War, argued that Congress had acted in order to suppress political speech like his. He cited legislative history, a commonly used method of statutory interpretation. Here is what a Senate committee had to say about the law that they were considering. Quote, the committee has taken notice of the defiant destruction and mutilation of draft cards by dissident persons who disapprove of national policy. If allowed to continue unchecked, this contumacious conduct represents a potential threat to the exercise of the power to raise and support armies." Close quotes. That's the way old people talk back in the old days. <laughs> they also said, quote, the House Committee on Armed Services is fully aware of and shares in the deep concern expressed throughout the nation over the increasing incidences in which individuals and large groups of individuals openly defy and encourage others to defy the authority of their government by destroying or mutilating their draft cards." Close quotes. Regular people such as ourselves reading that committee report, would conclude that Congress was acting to stop the public burning of draft cards because Congress felt that that type of political protest or speech represented a danger to America. Here is what the First Circuit Court of Appeals had to say about O'Brien's argument. Quote, we would be closing our eyes in the light of the prior law if we did not see on the face of the amendment that it was precisely directed at public as distinguished from private destruction. In other words, a special offense was committed by persons such as the defendant who made a spectacle of their disobedience. In singling out persons engaging in protest for special treatment, the amendment strikes at the very core of what the First Amendment protects." Close quotes. The Supreme Court reversed and upheld O'Brien's conviction, holding that Congress had not intended to suppress any speech. As Chief Justice Warren wrote, quote, inquiries into congress congressional motives or purposes are a hazardous matter. When the issue is simply the interpretation of legislation, the court will look to statements by legislators for guidance as to the purpose of the legislature because the benefit to sound decision-making in this circumstance is thought sufficient to risk the possibility of misreading Congress's purpose. It is entirely a different matter when we are asked to void a statute that is, under well-settled criteria, constitutional on its face, on the basis of what fewer than a handful of congressmen said about it." Close quotes. If that was too technical for you ordinary mortals to understand, let me, a recognized constitutional scholar, translate it for you. We will cite legislators' comments when it supports the outcome we want and say that those comments are dangerously misleading when they contradict the outcome we want. Someone in the audience here or in my vast radio leadership, listenership, might be thinking, now wait a second, Professor Purvis, if that is your real name. Are you saying that judges decide the case first and then use their rhetorical skills to write a justification that fits that outcome? No, of course I'm not saying that. That would mean our system of justice was a sham, a joke, 
where the very institution designated by the Constitution to enforce governmental restraints that preserve our most precious freedoms was simply a rubber stamp or a hatchet applied to the acts of the political branches. Judges do their best to apply neutral principles of law in a good faith analytical process to arrive at a reasoned outcome. If they occasionally disagree with each other, it is about minor technical points of law. They don't take completely opposite points of view on major legal issues presented to them. Back to freedom of speech. The plain meaning of the rule about speech that I previously quoted, which you all recognized was part of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, is clear. Congress shall not be permitted to regulate the speech of anyone in America. Yet from the first cases directly addressing freedom of speech, which were decided in the early 20th century, all but a few Supreme Court justices have rejected this meaning. Why? Because it's obvious, that's why. As Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, a demigod of constitutional law, pointed out, and I'm paraphrasing, no one would write a law like the Freedom of Speech Clause without an exception for bad speech like falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater. So if the plain meaning of the clause appears to do that, it can't be what the enactors intended. And what about defamation? That was a crime at common law. The enactors of the First Amendment must have intended to leave it out of freedom of speech, even though they didn't write it that way. Not to mention pictures of naked people. And don't forget about speech that decent people consider immoral and harmful, such as curse words or criticism of Jesus or horrible things like that. To interpret the freedom of speech clause, the justices utilized, without explicitly saying so, another theory, sometimes called textualism or interpretivism or non-originalism. This mode of interpretation does not seek to identify the actual literal intent of the framers or whomever. It identifies the constitutional values that the provisions of the Constitution must have been intended to protect and then applies those values to the modern issue before the court. And one value that every constitutional scholar agrees was meant to be protected by the Freedom of Speech Clause is political speech. Because we are a republic and we elect officials who will make and enforce our laws, speech about who should be elected is a critical component of self-government. A regulation of political speech, it is settled, is subject to strict scrutiny, as the Supreme Court held in Arizona Free Enterprise Club's Freedom Club PAC versus Bennett, a 2011 decision, quote, Discussion of public issues and debate on the qualifications of candidates are integral to the operation of our system of government. As a result, the First Amendment has its fullest and most urgent application to speech uttered during a campaign for political office. Laws that burden political speech are accordingly subject to strict scrutiny, which requires the government to prove that the restriction furthers a compelling interest and is narrowly tailored to achieve that interest." Close quotes. Which brings us to the question, why is money speech? Let's start with the plain meaning doctrine, which I despise so much. Speech is when a person communicates, and let's not quibble about how she does it, talking, signing, writing, waving flags. There are myriad ways to transmit a communication from one person to another. Money is a representation of financial value a marker that we agree upon that facilitates financial transactions. Speech and money are not the same thing. For you originalists in the audience, did the framers intend speech as used in the First Amendment to include money as speech? Well, when the Federalist Papers, which are often cited as evidence of the framers' intent, were published, did Madison and Hamilton physically create every copy that was distributed or did they pay someone to print those copies? According to my research, 77 of these essays were published serially in newspapers such as the Independent Journal, the New York Packet, and the Daily Advertiser between October 1787 and August 1788. 
So see, they were advertising even while the Constitution was being framed. A law that made it illegal for one person to pay another person to print words written by the first person would certainly have been regarded by the framers as a regulation of speech. As we stand or sit here in 2012, we need textualism to apply the freedom of speech clause to radio, television, the internet, tweets, jabbers, blogs, and other social media. Because none of those things existed when the First Amendment was adopted nor were they contemplated except by opium addicts or people capable of precognition, and they didn't jot their visions down. But the value of political communication in our constitutional system, settled in law, is the same regardless of the medium of transmission. In order to make our form of self-government work, we need to discuss the opinions, qualifications, policies, and other relevant information about the political candidates who will become our leaders, especially if they are Kenyan, Muslim, Socialist, Communist, Manchurian candidate moles. The first modern era Supreme Court case to address regulation of money used for purposes of political communication was Buckley versus Vallejo, decided in 1976. There had been previous federal regulations of expenditures in connection with political campaigns, principally imposing disclosure requirements. But the 1974 amendments to the Federal Election Campaign Act for the first time regulated political contributions and expenditures and created an enforcement mechanism in the Federal Elections Commission. The lower courts treated regulation of money as involving symbolic speech, that is, they regarded the use of money in politics as an act of conduct that was done for communication purposes. And thus, if the government targeted the conduct element in the symbolic speech and only incidentally affected the communications element, mid-level constitutional scrutiny was applicable. This is called the O'Brien test after the draft card burning case I mentioned earlier. The Supreme Court in Buckley rejected the lower court's analysis, holding, quote, some forms of communication made possible by the giving and spending of money involve speech alone. Some involve conduct primarily, and some involve a combination of the two. Yet this court has never suggested that the dependence of a communication on the expenditure of money operates itself to introduce a non-speech element or to reduce the exacting scrutiny required by the First Amendment." Close quotes. I don't want to go into the intricacies of how the Supreme Court justices applied strict scrutiny in Buckley, or the rhetorical gyrations the court went through in subsequent decisions before ultimately arriving at the present view represented by cases like McConnell and Citizens United. In very broad summary, Buckley held that a governmental purpose to avoid actual corruption did not justify regulation of political contributions and expenditures because anti-bribery and similar laws provided a less restrictive means of accomplishing that interest. But a government purpose to avoid the appearance of corruption, that is, the belief by much of the American public that candidates who were elected made decisions as officials to favor those who had given them lots of money, did justify regulation of certain campaign contributions. The current, much more conservative Supreme Court does not appear to regard either of these interests as satisfying strict scrutiny. And some constitutional scholars believe that they will soon strike down all attempts to regulate money in connection with political campaigns. On very rare occasions, I have been known to criticize the decisions of the legal geniuses who sit on the Supreme Court. But I am largely in agreement with the notion that the Freedom of Speech Clause prohibits government from regulating campaign contributions and expenditures for purposes of political communication by human beings in the United States. Constitutional rights generally, and freedom of speech in particular, are so vital and precious that they should be vigorously and thoroughly protected from all government interference. Whether laws requiring disclosure of the identity of campaign contributors or spenders should also fail strict scrutiny is an issue that I have not personally resolved. 
But even having this opinion, another question must be asked. Why should corporations have the same constitutional right to freedom of speech that humans have? In the legal area having to do with the ownership of businesses operated for profit, a single person opening, operating a business is just a person operating a business. There is no legal separation between the person and her property. If two or more people carry on a business for profit, the law originally regarded them as a partnership. A very important aspect of life in general, you'll be surprised to learn, and business conducted for profit in particular, is that things may go wrong and you lose your money. Then you can't pay your obligations and you're thrown into debtor's prison. Or at least, you would be thrown into prison, you deadbeat loser, if America had any moral values. If a single human who owns a business suffers losses, or a partnership of humans suffer losses, Credit, tried to sneak in, didn't you? Creditors can sue and take as much of the property of the humans involved as the law will otherwise allow. People don't like losing their money, so corporations were invented. Corporations have a long history. They have been recognized in law since at least 6th century Rome. Not going to get into that. My point is that one of the major advantages of recognizing a legal business ent entity separate from its human owners arises when the law grants limited liability to that entity. If a business operated by a corporation loses money and cannot pay its obligations, the humans who own the corporation, the shareholders, are not personally liable for the corporate debts, with rare exceptions not applicable here. This is good for everyone because people being willing to take economic risks promotes growth and innovation, and not just in the job creator sense, it really does. And if every new business venture represented a threat of total loss to investors, they would be reticent about investing. There are many other economic advantages to the corporate form of ownership, so corporations are good. The way the law provided this useful entity status to corporations came to be described as a corporation being a legal person. So is a corporation a person entitled to the rights protected by the Constitution? Using the plain meaning originalist approach, we could ask, how often does the word corporation appear in the Constitution? Not once. If you have some spare time, and I know a lot of you do, Read Justices Thomas' concurrence and Justice Stevens' dissent in the Citizens United case, where each of them addresses the framers' intent as to whether corporations should be entitled to the constitutional right of freedom of speech. Does it say anything about originalism, or more likely about the decisional processes of judges, that they come to completely opposite conclusions? Here is what Professor Darrell A. H. Miller wrote in 2011 about corporations' rights in his New York University Law Review article, Guns Incorporated, Citizens United, McDonald, and the Future of Corporate Constitutional Rights. Quote, No unified theory governs when or to what extent the Constitution protects a corporation. Instead, the justices resort to a grab bag of history, metaphysical rumination, Lochnerian tailings and pragmatism to resolve the specific corporate constitutional claim at hand. The court's approach has left us with a broken and disjointed jurisprudence, a string sight rather than a doctrine. Close quotes. Man, that guy sounds like a snot. <laughs> Not a very respectful way to describe the work of legal geniuses. In any event, the majority opinion in the Citizens United decision is unequivocal that the Constitution does not permit government to treat corporations as speakers any differently than human speakers. And since it violates the Freedom of Speech Clause to limit any speaker's independent expenditures in connection with a political issue, corporations can spend as much as their CEOs desire to engage in political advocacy. 
Were the uber-conservative justices in the majority and Citizens United right? That is a difficult question. If rich people want to spend their money through the corporations they control to promote political positions that will favor themselves, is it good constitutional or democratic policy to allow government to silence them? What impact would no speech rights for corporations have on the New York Times Corporation and other media corporations? On nonprofit corporations like the Sierra Club? The lessons I would like everyone to draw from these controversies is that we should assiduously protect freedom of speech for everyone. And we should insist that our leaders select judges who will interpret the Constitution applying non-political principles in good faith. I cannot leave today's topic without commenting on what appears to me to be the fundamental concern at the heart of campaign finance laws and the progressive opposition to judicial decisions like Citizens United. This is the belief or perception that whoever spends the most money will sway the electorate and win the election. In addition, there, was a, there is a widely held belief that I mentioned previously that elected officials make governmental decisions that favor big contributors to their campaigns. Assuming these things are true, do they represent a danger to our form of self-government? Here is what Justice Kennedy had to say on this subject, writing in McConnell v. FEC in 2003, quote, Favoritism and influence are not avoidable in representative politics. It is in the nature of an elected representative to favor certain policies and by necessary corollary to favor the voters and contributors who supported those policies. It is a well understood and substantial and legitimate reason, if not the only reason, to cast a vote for or to make a contribution to one candidate over another, that the candidate will respond by producing those political outcomes the supporter favors. Democracy is premised on responsiveness. Close quotes. So it's all good. What are we worried about? Here is some data on the relationship of money and politics presented on the www.opensecrets.org website. As to the federal election held in 2010, in the House of Representatives, the average winner spent approximately $1,440,000. The average loser spent approximately $690,000, less than half. In the Senate, the average winner spent approximately $9,700,000, and the average loser spent approximately $6,500,000, about two-thirds of what the winner spent. These are just averages. They don't mean that the candidate who spends the most money will always win, at least in California. Remember Meg Whitman? She spent $160 million in 2010, losing the gubernatorial race to Jerry Brown, who couldn't make it today, who spent $24.8 million. Who do you intend to vote for in the upcoming elections in November 2012? Did you make your choice based on political advertising? Will your choice change based what, uh, on what you see on television in the next six weeks? Maybe you are all liberal elites who think you're smarter than everybody else. In the 2008 presidential election, just over 61% of the vote eligible population cast ballots. In the 2010 general election, about 41% of eligible voters actually voted. Is the threat to our democracy perceived by progressives corporate money, or is it the lack of participation by eligible voters combined with the manner in which those who vote make their decisions. George Lakoff is a UC Berkeley professor of linguistics and cognitive science who has written extensively about how political speech influences voters. My oversimplified summary of his analysis is that the most powerful way to get voters to support a position is to frame that position using emotion triggering language that invokes moral worldviews within the voter. He asserts this is because most humans, if not all humans, 
make decisions based on their emotional reactions rather than on reasoning or rationality. I'm not sure if Professor Lakoff is correct, but it makes sense to me and explains much of the election results for the past 30 years. But if Professor Lakoff is correct, that would mean that there would be advertising agencies running political campaigns instead of political scientists. And that's crazy. I will close with this passage by Professor Larissa Barnett Lidsky in her 2010 University of Illinois Law Review article, Nobody's Fools, the Rational Audience as First Amendment Ideal. Quote, defending rationalism at this point in the American experience seems slightly quixotic. Recent events certainly cast doubt on the assertion of First Amendment doctrine that the American people are neither sheep nor fools. But as John Updike has written, believing in the American political experiment is at bottom a matter of trusting the citizens to know their own minds and best interests. And though the implementation will inevitably be approximate and debatable, and though totalitarianism or technocratic government can obtain some swift successes, in the end, only a democracy can enlist the people's energies on a sustained and renewable basis. It is this leap of faith in our collective capacities that has led First Amendment doctrine to construct the ideal of the rational audience. It is our duty as citizens to live up to it." Close quotes. Well, thank you very much for coming then. The San Joaquin Agricultural Law Review, founded in 1990, is the oldest agricultural law review in the country. It is published by the students of San Joaquin College of Law, which is located in California's Central Valley, one of the richest agricultural regions in the world. The Law Review presents student and scholar works on legal issues affecting agriculture, but the topics are also of special interest to those in government, business, and law. The San Joaquin Agricultural Law Review provides an objective national forum for analyzing issues affecting agriculture. It's received judicial and critical recognition, and its articles have been cited by the California Supreme Court, the California Appellate Court, the United States District Court, and others. Articles have also been cited in the annotations of several California statutes. Hello, my name is Seth Merton from the San Joaquin Agricultural Law Review, and my comment is titled Pruning Direct Shipping Barriers for Optimal Yield, How the Dormant Commerce Clause Limits the 21st Amendment. What immediately sparked my interest about my comment was, uh, first of all, that we live in the valley and uh, grapes are a huge part of our commerce here as, uh, as is wine, and I believe that we have a, a budding wine industry, and so I wanted to write a comment that was going to be relevant to those two areas. Um, secondly, I have friends that own wineries and um, you know, my, my interest was tremendously increased when talking with them. Uh, they expressed their uh, disappointment with regulations that other states were enacting that were uh, limiting their ability to sell wine in those states. Um, so as I began to research, I, I developed a, um, kind of a common theme that was arising in Midwest and East Coast states where States were limiting the um, ability of a consumer to purchase wine from the internet, which for a small winery, um, like many of my friends own, uh, the ability to, for a consumer to go onto the internet and purchase a bottle of wine uh, is really the, the core of how they sustain themselves. And so if a state from uh, the Midwest or the East Coast was limiting that ability of a consumer to do so, they were also indirectly limiting the ability of a small California winery in the valley to grow or, or even to sustain themselves and stay afloat. So uh, as I looked into this, I found that there are, uh, there's a number of different laws that were affecting the um, kind of regulatory uh, framework that, was, that exists. Um, one of these areas came from the Constitution. It's called the Dormant Commerce Clause, and it's the idea that states can't enact regulations that um, put burdens on other states and their ability to ship items into uh, the, those states. 
Uh, and then the other was the 21st Amendment, which is kind of ju juxtaposed to the idea of the Dormant Commerce Clause. And it's the idea that um, states have the ability to regulate the, um, the trade in alcohol within their borders. Um, and those, those two ideas really don't mesh well, and so that was kind of the problem. And so as I looked at the, uh, the regulations, uh, one of the things that I was looking for was how can states take steps to limit the burdens that they place on other states' wineries. Um, and in doing so, I felt that that would be uh, helpful to small wineries here in California. Uh, so one of the things that uh, Midwest and East Coast winer, or excuse me, East Coast states were doing was to uh, demand consumers to purchase bottles of wine um, in person before having them shipped to their uh, their home state. Which, if you're a resident in, say, New York or Kentucky or even in a Midwest state like Indiana, getting out to California to purchase a bottle of wine could be very prohibitive and. Um, while a trip to Napa might be interesting, uh, a trip to the Valley may be not what you had in mind to purchase a bottle of wine. So even if you could find a winery here in the Valley on the internet, you would not be able to get that bottle of wine back to your home state. Um, so uh, I looked at the original intent of the 21st Amendment and the original intent of the Dormant Commerce Clause and really determined that um, so long as states are able to kind of police the uh, underage drinking problems within their, within their borders and collect taxes, that there shouldn't be a problem with states uh, allowing consumers to purchase wine over the internet and to have that wine directly shipped to their homes. Um, in doing so, I think that they would allow consumers to have more freedom and more choice to, to, drink, the, to drink the wine that they choose uh, or would you know, most like to consume. And they would also be helping other states' wineries namely California, Oregon, and Washington, where the wine industries are a huge part of our, of our commerce. I'm Seth Merton, the managing editor of the San Joaquin Agricultural Law Review, and thanks for watching. The success of San Joaquin College of Law is both measured and reflected by the success of its alumni. Among the more than 1,300 graduates are 24 judges and court commissioners, the Fresno, Tulare, and Madera County District Attorneys, the California Health and Human Services Secretary, and practitioners in every area of public and private service. We're pleased to offer this portion of San Joaquin College of Law today to a member of that alumni rank. Hi, I'm Karen Mathis. I graduated from San Joaquin College of Law in 1995. Ever since I passed the California bar exam and obtained my license to practice law later that year, I've been practicing family law in Fresno and various other counties in the San Joaquin Valley and over toward the coast. Today, I want to talk to you about what I do in my volunteer time, and that is connected with uh, modern-day slavery and human trafficking. There is a huge un unaddressed problem right here in the San Joaquin Valley and around the world with modern-day slavery. The current widely accepted estimate of the number of slaves in the, in the world today is 27 million. The United States has estimated that persons held in slavery in this country is 800,000, but that is acknowledged to be probably a very, very low estimate of the actual numbers. There are two ways which slavery enters our lives. One is that it is occurring around us in the San Joaquin Valley. The uh, state of California produced a report on modern day slavery and human trafficking in 2007. Kamala Harris was on the task force which produced the report and it identified the, uh, the most common areas for a person to be laboring in, in, and enslaved in California today as garment work, agricultural work, sex work, and domestic work. The state of California has acknowledged that it is a top destination worldwide for human traffickers. This is so because of the international points of entry and international borders. Uh, 
the state also recognized that sex trafficking is not the most common forced labor for people to be enslaved in the United States today. The Fresno County District Attorney and the local U.S. Attorney prosecute only sex crimes. So the other areas where people may be enslaved are not receiving any attention. I'll talk about that more later with respect to some of the laws. Uh, enforcement is problematic worldwide in this country, in California, in the San Joaquin Valley, because it's so difficult to identify victims and to get victims to testify. There are a variety of reasons for that. They're afraid. There are threats to injure or kill them, which are often followed through on. Uh, or injure or kill a family member. People often don't speak the language if they've been brought from another country. They don't know where to turn for help and they may not even know that a crime is being committed and that they are the victim of uh, someone breaking a law. Um, there is a, a real iron grip on people held in slavery, men, women, and children. So it's difficult to prosecute this crime. Uh, and even though that's important, the far more important area for our activities is marketing and investing. That is the other way that slavery enters the lives of probably each and every one of us every day or many times a day. Anyone who drives, drinks, eats, smokes, talks on a phone, uh, wears clothing, is probably a frequent beneficiary of modern-day slavery. We need to know what is behind the products which are marketed to us and make choices based on that knowledge. And the same holds true with respect to investing. I, what I wanted primarily to talk about today is some of the laws in California which affect human trafficking. California was the very first state in the union to, uh, uh, to pass an anti-human trafficking statute in 2005. California also has the Transparency and Supply Chains Act, which uh, as of January 1 of 2012 requires manufacturers and retailers who are doing a gross worldwide business in excess of $100 million to post on their websites any efforts that they're engaged in to keep slavery out of their supply line. Um, I, I want to highlight each law and some of its defects. That particular law, the Transparency and Supply Chains Act, doesn't really require anything, does not require manufacturers or retailers to take any action, only to advertise their actions, uh, which could actually promote their exploitation of slave labor because they're allowed to, um, to market their activities which may sound as though they're protecting people when in reality they're, they are not. And it's very important to get your information from several sources and to read criticisms of various laws or people or organizations to know, to get a good idea for what is really going on. Uh, the harkin Engel Protocol, a federal law, is a prime example. It regulates the chocolate manufacturers if they decide to participate. They can join, they can pay into a fund which supposedly is rehabilitative for uh, the child slaves who pick an estimated 40% of the world's chocolate crop in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. Uh, but there are scathing criticisms of that law and primarily it is a self-enforcing law and so you can see probably that the companies which are making scads of money by exploiting children and forcing them to work as slaves are, do not have an interest in policing themselves to, to avoid that situation because it will cut profits. And in fact, it hasn't had any appreciable effect in the time that uh, 
since it has been passed. Um, there are T visas and U visas provided by the federal government for victims of trafficking, which are extremely difficult for people to get. There are a lot of problems with them. They are authorized by the tra uh, Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which has now expired. There is a Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, which is intended to extend the protections for two years, but uh, both the House version and the Senate version have not even come up for a vote, and at this time, nobody knows whether they will. Um, it is important to know that fair trade, which we hear a lot about, the Fair Trade Act, protects a grower, not a worker. In some cases, workers may receive some additional protections, particularly if they're family members of a grower, but uh, fair trade is absolutely not a guarantee that there is no slavery in a product. Uh, and at the same time, the Fair Trade Act is being attacked from many quarters who want to weaken its provisions rather than strengthen them. Um, finally, there is the CASE Act, which is Proposition 35 on the 2012 ballot in California. This is uh, an, a proposition which is intended to set or to modify the sentencing guidelines for sex traffickers only. There is a, um, an opposition to the wording and the provisions of that act on a blog written by John Vanek, who's a retired San Jose police lieutenant, which has some very good criticisms of the act. The sentencing is kind of all over the place, doesn't really make sense with respect to, uh, for one thing, segregating victims of sex trafficking from other slavery victims. And the, it also separates uh, minor victims from adult victims, giving harsher penalties to uh, offenders who abuse an adult victim unless certain things are found with respect to the child victims. There are a lot of problems with the proposition. I would suggest that people read it and read at least John Vanek's blog to get a good idea and be able to make up their minds. My name is Karen Mathis. I graduated from San Joaquin College of Law in 1995. It improved my life and I thank you for listening. San Joaquin College of Law has two free legal clinics operated by students and overseen by faculty members. SJCL students are doing groundbreaking work in non-adversarial property division agreements and divorces in the mediation clinic. Clients meet with a student to work out a marital settlement agreement, which can then be filed with the court. The New American Legal Clinic assists legal immigrants in obtaining citizenship, working through the processes of naturalization. The Now Clinic also assists those seeking family-based immigrant visas or U visas, depending upon eligibility. Hello, I'm Justin Atkinson, here with Professor Jessica Smith Bobadilla, and we're here at San Joaquin College of Law, and we're talking to you about the New American Legal Clinic, a free legal clinic that we, um, that we staff with students um, to serve uh, immigrants and help them to legally come to the United States or legally stay in the United States. And I wanted to talk a little bit, a bit about our inaugural class that started last semester of eight students. Uh, each one of these students had a different interest in the immigrant population and they learned immigration law and on top of actually serving an, an underserved, a historically underserved population. Um, we have, we represented in that class, we had Punjabi speakers, we had Spanish speakers of course in this area. We have um, people whose families are involved in farming. Of course, um, here in this area, farming is very, very important, and there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about um, different laws, e-verify, and those those things about um, the the vitality and the and the future of, of, of farmers being able to staff um, their farms. So um, each student had kind of a different um, interest in learning about immigration, immigration, immigration law. Um, Armenian population was represented as well. We had a uh, very, very good results, uh, served a lot of people. Um, one of the services that we do provide is something called naturalization workshops. Now, naturalization is when you have a legal permanent resident that um, somehow became a legal permanent resident 
um, they're living here and they want to take that final step to become a full-fledged citizen, um, be able to vote in elections. And what we do is we, we actually go out to different populations and we provide those services. We, we, we pre-screen people to make sure that, that they qualify um, to become a citizen and we um, actually fill out the paperwork for them. Last semester, we worked with the Punjabi-speaking population uh, at a Sikh temple on Clovis in the 99, and we served about 45 people um, in helping them prepare their documentation. And Professor Bobadilla will now speak to us a little bit about what that naturalization process is and who qualifies to be naturalized. Thank you, Professor Atkinson. Um, yes, so the process to naturalization or acquiring citizenship if you were born um, outside of the United States is um, a little bit trickier than a lot of people believe. First of all, one of the things that's a common misconception is that you can just go straight to citizenship, that you can just, if you were born abroad, walk down to any office like USCIS Fresno, which is the benefits office that we have locally at Fresno Street and Fulton Mall, and file an N-400, which is a citizenship application. That's just not the case. Um, there are several steps before that. You have to become a permanent resident first. It's hard to become a permanent resident depending on the circumstances of when you were brought here or when you choose to come to the United States and what type of visa or lack of visa you had. Um, so that, that whole uh, process of getting to even the stage you could apply for citizenship is very complicated. Um, the basic requirements for acquiring citizenship in the United States, if you were not born, in, you know, of course, in the United States as a United States citizen and did not derive it as a young child through one of your parents, um, is that you have to have been a legal permanent resident or a green card holder for five years preceding your application. You can have um, been a legal permanent resident for only three years if you are married to a United States citizen at the time of your application for citizenship. That is the only exception to the five years legal residency requirement. Um, you also have to establish that you're a person of good moral character. And there are various things that can go into that. Um, they're generally looking at arrests, um, criminal history that are being arrested that resulted in a criminal conviction of some type. but. Um, even multiple traffic fines that went unpaid for some reason um, can be used as a discretionary matter to decide this person isn't in the view of the adjudicating officer of good moral character. Um, when taken to the extreme, those types of things might be considered. Um, there's also an English language requirement that the applicant pass a civics um, and history series of questions and in addition, um, be able to converse in English with the officer and um, also complete basic reading and writing in English. There are some exceptions to the English language rule, but those are hard to attain unless you've had legal residence for a really long time and are an older person, or if you have some documented medical dis, um, disability which would, re which would result in some type of neurological impairment which would prevent you from learning English sufficiently. Um, so the requirements are pretty strict. Um, they, generally, when someone files the application, it results in an interview, and the applicant is interviewed. Uh, generally, if they live in the Valley, they're interviewed at USCIS Fresno, and then a decision is made on the application, and they are sworn in if they, in fact, meet all of the requirements to the satisfaction of the interviewing officer. So if you are a legal permanent resident and you'd like to have more information about how to become a citizen, please give us a call at the law school. I'm Justin Atkinson. This is Professor Jessica smith Bobadilla. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this edition of San Joaquin College of Law Today, presented by San Joaquin College of Law, a nonprofit law school committed to educational excellence and community service. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the position or views of San Joaquin College of Law. This program has been produced in conjunction with the Community Media Access Collaborative. We invite you to join us in the future as we explore issues and events within the law school which are of general interest as well. For more information about San Joaquin College of Law, please visit our website at www.sjcl.edu or call 559-323-2100.